Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Crimes. I'm your host as always, Tyler Graf von Revick. That's right, that's right, I'm back again. I told you the hiatus is over, at least for now. And uh, today we're going to be, this episode is going to be over Carl Panzram, the human animal. So, let's put the sugar into it, and we will get on with the story. Get on with the episode. It's not a story, exactly. I mean, it's not like, like this is fake or anything. This all really happened. So, uh, I really appreciate everyone who has watched uh, the last video about Donald Henry Gaskins. i got to tell you, that one was pretty brutal. And, uh, quite frankly, I'm... Uh, Still kind of shocked by how horrible it was. I mean, I knew that guy was pretty bad. Like I said, I read his book, The uh, the Final Truth, or whatever it was back in uh, back when I was in school. Well, I, I wasn't really in school. I was, I was at a public library during school. So, needless to say, I had read it while I was in school, but not exactly at school. Does that make any sense? That probably doesn't make any sense. Maybe it does make sense. I don't know. It makes sense to me. So that's what we're going to stick with. All right. So we got our coffee and our sugar. We're good to go on that part. Sorry. Sorry. I know that's really loud. I apologize. I apologize. My bad. Let's see how good we got it. Oh, yeah. That's good stuff right there. That's good bocce. That's good bocce. Some people in the world are cursed with brutal needs. Some manage to overcome them. I mean, yeah. Yet others fall victim to their harsh desires and engage in them to no end. Ooh, I hate to meet someone like that. Some people ultimately decide to dominate everyone they come across to the point of death. This is the story of one such person. I'm assuming serial killers are often people that that engage in that kind of thing. Engage people to dominate everyone, which is kind of horrible when you think about it. Early life. Charles Carl Panzram was born on June 28th, 1891 in Grand Forks, Michigan. Sorry, Grand Forks, Minnesota. I forget there's probably a Grand Forks, Michigan too. Kind of a pretty common name out there. The sixth of seven children. His parents were East Prussian immigrants, Johann Gottlieb Panzram, also known as John, and Matilda Elizabeth Panzram, whose maiden name was Baldwin, often translated to Bolden, Baldwin, or Baldwin. And uh, Carl, yeah. A lot of people don't know this, but Carl is actually like the German uh, equivalent of Charles. See, I didn't know that until I looked into it like a couple of years ago, and I was like, really? Because the name Carl always just sounded kind of, that's kind of like an everybody name. I mean, everybody's named Carl, but then you actually look it up, and it, it means Charles. It really does. It's really interesting. It's like Carlo, Carlos, nobody cares. Uh, Pansram was forced to work on the family farm with his siblings from a young age. Uh, until truancy laws in the area made it illegal for parents to not send their kids to school. Angry about this new law, Panzram's parents instead forced their kids to work the farm throughout the night, letting them get less than two hours of sleep before school. Oh my. Panzram's parents were strict and abusive in their punishments, often chaining their children up or starving them when they misbehaved. Panzram was extremely disliked by other kids his age around this time, often because he was a known liar, a thief, and was prone to beating everyone else up. We're off to a good start. That was sarcasm, everyone. In 1897, John Panzram abandoned the family for good, and soon, one by one, the kids left the farm as well. Beginning in 1899, Panzram was charged in juvenile court for drunken disorderly behavior. In 1903, at 11, he was arrested for public drunkenness and jailed. After getting out, 
He stole some cake, apples, and a revolver from his neighbor. He stole some cake, some fruit, and a pistol. Darn it. Later that year, his mother, tired of his behavior, shipped him off to the Minnesota State Training School, a reform school, which was a popular destination for at-risk and criminal youth at the time. However, while in the school, Panzram was beaten and raped by the oh my god by the school staff in the workshop, rumored to be called the paint shop, because the paint spatters were actually blood from the beatings. Oh my, and the rapes and oh, damn, inflicted on the children. On July seventh, nineteen o five, Panzram set the school on fire and managed to escape detection, watching it burn to the ground. Yeah, that, damn right, I probably would have done the same. If I was in his situation, I mean, I don't, I don't go out setting stuff on fire. Don't, don't think I do. Seriously, I don't, I don't set stuff on fire. In fact, I'm scared of fires. Fire scares me. A few months later, he was sent to the Red Wing Training School for stealing money from his mom, being paroled in January 1906. Soon, Panzram was drinking all the time and committing burglaries and robberies galore. At age 14, Panzram attempted to murder a Lutheran minister with a stolen revolver. It's just getting worse. It's just, it's burglarizing, stealing, theft, which I guess is stealing, and now he's trying to kill people. A minister, no less. After this, and having no interest in living with his mother, who was currently mourning the loss of her youngest drowning, Panzerim left home permanently and decided to live the life of a hobo, jumping train cars, sleeping in abandoned areas, and stealing what he needed to survive. On one occasion, while jumping a train car, he was gang raped by several homeless men who had previous dibs on the train car. Oh, oh my God. But yeah, it's, I can't imagine that. That's probably ruined. Like, it's like that Gaskins guy in the last episode. You know, that, that gang rape and stuff can really, can really screw someone up. I mean, can really screw with their mind, their mentality, their psyche. I mean, it causes really severe problems. So, it... I'm not surprised that this guy's turning turning out like... Well, I think I don't really know what he's doing, so let's, let's see what happens. Crimes. In 1907, at 15, Panzram committed a string of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, and arsons throughout the Midwest. After getting wasted in a Montana bar, he enlisted in the Army and was assigned to a position with the 6th Infantry at Fort William Henry Harrison. Kind of weird how they always name like forts after like they name some not not all forts but they name some forts after like the presidents, uh, except for like Fort Lee. Like I think for, I, the Fort Lee was named after uh, Charles Lee. I think there was one that was named after Charles Lee, and he was actually like uh, like Benedict like a Benedict Arnold. He was uh, he did like co co uh, collaboration with um, the British. I'm sorry, this isn't, this isn't coffee and historic traders. Um, let's move on. However, Panzram proved insubordinate and lazy, receiving multiple misconduct punishments. This culminated in Panzram stealing $80 worth of supplies from the fort and getting arrested, following which he was sentenced to two years in Fort Leavenworth at the disciplinary barracks, read that as prison, and dishonorably discharged. Panzram wrote later that he had been a rotten egg previously, and the military prison had totally smashed any bit of good that was left within him. I didn't seem like he had any good in him, but then again. Resuming his criminal career after his release, Panzram stole anything he could get his hands on, including yachts, cars, bicycles, materials, and selling his items. He caught multiple prison terms for his misdeeds, serving time under his name and multiple other aliases, with times being served in Fresno, California, Rusk, Texas, The Dales in Oregon, Harrison, Ohio, Harrison, Idaho, Butte, Montana, as Jeff Davis, and Jefferson Rhodes in the Montana State Prison, as Jeff Baldwin in the Oregon State Penitentiary, as John O'Leary in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Sing Sing Prison in New York, at the Clinton Correctional Facility in New York, and finally in Washington, D.C. Damn, he was everywhere. Just in prison. During his prison stints, Panzram was to be was known to be exceptionally difficult to handle, attacking corrections officers, and getting as good as he gave. So I'm assuming he got into a lot of fights. 
At times, Panzram would try to work legitimate jobs, once being hired as an enforcer to break up union strikes, and once as an arm and once on an army transport ship as a steward, but he was discharged from this when he showed up staggeringly drunk. Following an attempt to enlist in the Mexican Army in 1910, he traveled to Del Rio, Texas, where he was a, where he abducted, assaulted, and throttled a man for thirty-five dollars. What? Well, it's 1910. I guess thirty-five dollars was like probably three thousand dollars. Still, I, yeah, that's that's crazy. Inflation. It's a bitch, right? <laughs> Over the next few years, Panzram plied his trades at running from the police, serving small terms in prison, and stealing numerous items, all these while traveling the continental United States. Panzram burglarized a, ho a house in Astoria, Oregon on June 1, 1915. He was arrested again while trying to hawk the stolen items. He listed his name as Jeff Baldwin, using his mother's maiden name, and was sentenced to seven years in the Oregon State Prison in Salem. Salem, Oregon, not Salem, Massachusetts obviously. The warden, Harry Minto, was fond of intense punishment for infractions, and Panzram felt he had met his match in terms of the force, openly challenging Minto to keep him in for seven years. Panzram was forced with many punishments, including solitary confinement, being hung from rafters, and severe beatings by corrections officers. Later that year, Panzram and a fellow inmate escaped. However, they were nearly recaptured by the warden and guards until the other inmate, Otto Hooker, what? Oh, Otto Hooker, Hooker's his last name, killed Minto. Panzram was recaptured and sentenced to 60 days in solitary confinement until he attempted to escape in 1917. While on the run, he engaged in two shootouts with police and nearly killed the chief deputy sheriff, Joseph Frum, until he was recaptured and sent back to prison. Wait, a chief deputy sheriff. Would that just be a sheriff? I mean, how many deputies are there? I guess, I guess there's a lot if it's a big place. The next year, Panzram escaped by sawing through the bars in his cell, escaped via a freight train, and changed his physical appearance, shaving his mustache. I mean, hey, I suppose if I shaved my mustache, y'all probably wouldn't even recognize me. I'd probably be someone totally different. Yeah, I'd have to get like a to, to, to totally change my my appearance. I'd have to get like a nose reduction. I'd have to dye my hair blonde. I'd have to grow a full beard. I'd probably have to put on about two hundred pounds, and I'd probably have to like I don't know start using a wheelchair because I'm six foot five. So it's very it's not it's not like I'm, I was I, I, it's not like I, I was not I was not made to change my appearance. I was made to be this way for the rest of my life. While in New York City, Panzram managed to qualify for and get a seaman ID and sailed on the steamship James S. Whitney to Panama. Departing in Panama, Panzram stole a small boat with a drunken associate who killed everyone on the boat. Damn. Everyone on the boat, but was arrested when they caught the attention of a passing officer. Panzram quickly disappeared from the scene, making his way to Peru to work the copper mines, and then, using his earnings, he traveled into Chile, back to Texas, where he caught a ship that took him to London, traveled to Edinburgh. He then took a spot on a ship departing to Paris, and then traveled to Hamburg. Okay. So I guess he's on the run. He's good. I mean, he's in Europe. As long as he keeps his nose clean, he should be fine. Murders. Panzram returned to America. Dude, why are you returning to America? You, like, got a bunch of warrants out for your arrest. Why would you... What, what, why, why would you do that, idiot? I mean, I don't like this guy. He's, he's, he's a douchebag, but... Just the same. Why would he do that? I mean, if you're on the run and you successfully make it overseas... I don't know. Stay overseas? Don't come back? Hello? Uh, returned to America in 1920 in Newport, Rhode Island. In August, he burglarized the William Howard Taft Mansion in New Haven, Connecticut. Wait, William William H. Taft. That's he was the president, right? President and uh, Chief Justice of the U.S. So I know my history. I always used to get William Taft and Grover Cleveland mixed up because they kind of look the same. 
because they both had the short hair and they were hefty guys and they had the the uh, handlebar mustache. But they're not the same. This was done out of personal hatred for Taft, who had signed his name on the incarceration papers for Panzram to be sent to Leavenworth, Leavenworth when Taft was the Secretary of War. Yeah. That's that's deep hatred, right? Well, how long ago was that? That was like way back in the day. Panzram stole a vast sum of jewelry, bonds, and Taft's forty-five pistol. Forty-five caliber pistol. Okay. With the money he stole, Panzram bought a yacht and went on a journey. This journey wasn't one for adventure or to find work. No, this journey was for Panzram to engage in as much bloodshed as he desired. Oh, he was going all out, I guess. Sailing into New York City, Panzram would bring sailors from the dive bars to his yacht, where he would beat, sodomize, and murder them, and, jump, and dump their bodies overboard. Panzram killed an estimated 10 to 15 people in this fashion. The murder spree ended after Panzram drunkenly ran aground and was forced to abandon In October 1920, Panzram was arrested in Connecticut for possession of a gun and burglaries. He served six months in Bridgeport. Upon his release, Panzram stowed away on a ship to South Africa and landed in Luanda, which at the time served as the capital of the Portuguese colony of Angola. In 1921, Panzram burned down an oil rig that he had been working on. Afterwards, he sodomized and brutally beat an 11-year-old boy to death. Oh my god. A short time later, he hired a boat of six rowing crewmen and proceeded to shoot them each, sodomize their corpses, and... What is with this guy? And disposed of their bodies in the swamp for the crocodiles that swarmed the area. He did this so he could watch the cold-blooded reptiles tear the corpses limb from limb. God. Whew. Got a bit of a problem there, Panzram. You got a screw or two loose. After his return to the U.S., Panzram violently sodomized two boys. One he beat to death in Salem, Massachusetts in 1922, then strangling the other one in New Haven later that year. In June 1923, in New Rochelle, Panzram jacked a yacht that belonged to the local police chief, using it to pick up a 15-year-old boy named George Wallowson. Wallowson? Wallace, Wallowson. Under the guise of a job offer, and instead he sodomized the youth and kept him on. Oh, he didn't kill him? Huh. See, he still sodomized him. That's horrible. A few days later, on June 27th, Panzram killed a man who attempted to rob the yacht and threw the body into a river near Kingston. On June 28th, Panzram docked at Poughkeepsie with Wallison, stealing over $1,000 worth of nets. George Wallison, having saw the murder Panzram committed and tired of being assaulted, jumped overboard and made his way to the shore, running to the police. Afterward, the police were on the lookout for Panzram's alias, Captain John O'Leary. Arresting Captain O'Leary the next day in Nyack. Is it Nyack? Or is it Nyack? Nyack. Nyack. What the fuck am I doing? The next month, Panzram tried to escape jail by getting his lawyer to give him bail money in exchange for the stolen boat. After which, Panzram skipped out and was rearrested on June 26th in Larchmont. On August 29th, O'Leary was cleared as a suspect in the death of Co Dorothy Kaufman a month earlier. For the theft and sodomy, Panzram was sentenced to five years' imprisonment. He later confessed to his alias, Jeff Baldwin, and was imprisoned in Clinton Prison in Dannemora, New York. He was released in July 1928 and celebrated it by murdering and sodomizing a man in Baltimore, Maryland. What is it with this guy in sodomy? What are you, a freak? Seriously. Like, I, I... I don't know. Arrest and trial. On August 30th, 1928, Carl Panzram was arrested in Baltimore for a burglary he committed on a dentist in D.C., having stolen a radio and jewelry ten days prior. 
While in interrogation, Panzram confessed that he had killed three boys earlier that month, one in Salem, one in New Haven, and one in Philadelphia. The police were able to confirm that Panzram had murdered a boy in Philadelphia, but unable to confirm that he had killed a boy in Charleston, Massachusetts, after he confessed, Panzram revealed that he had an intense desire to poison New York's water supply with arsenic to bomb a train or provoke war between the U.S. and Great Britain. All this in his intense urge to cause as much death as possible. Yeah, this guy needs to be put down. Panzram was quickly tried and received a maximum sentence of 25 years to life in Leavenworth Federal Pen. Panzram, still full of murderous contemptuous lust, warned the warden on his first day that he would brutally and absolutely kill the first man that bothered him. The warden took this threat lightheartedly, and Panzram was sent to work in the prison laundry. The Leavenworth prison laundry was run by a foreman known as Robert Warnke. 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 I don't know. I'm assuming it's a Polish name. I don't know. Who was a malignant bully and enjoyed fully antagonizing the other inmates. Panzram was quick to warn Warnke to back off from him. Warnke, however, couldn't resist the temptation to poke fun at Panzram, and soon Panzram ended Warnke's life with an iron bar on June 28, 1929. Yes, if the dude who's in prison for multiple mass murders is telling you to back off and you keep screwing with him, I'm not going to be surprised that he ends you. I mean, seriously, that's just common sense. When the big guy tells you to, you know, piss off, you piss off. Death. Carl Panzram was convicted of Robert Warnke's death and given the death penalty. Panzram eagerly took this new sentence to heart and was quick to refuse any appeals for his sake. When several death penalty opponents and human rights workers attempted to intervene, Panzram wrote back to them, The only thanks you and your kind will ever get from me for your work on my behalf is that I wish you all had one neck and I had my hands on it. I have no interest in reforming myself. My only desire is to reform people who want to reform me, and I believe the only way to reform someone is to kill them. Well, that's... Damn. All right, Carl, you have got... <laughs> you know what? He wants to go. Let him go. Seriously. This guy does not remotely sound like he's worth like keeping alive. Panzram found himself a target on death row, getting a particularly severe beating from other inmates, and often from the guards. However, Panzram ended up befriending a corrections officer named Henry Philip Lesser, who gave him money for cigarettes and snacks. Panzram, appreciating this act of kindness, asked for writing materials, which Lesser gave, and wrote his own summary of nihilistic hatred and spiteful philosophy aimed towards humanity. Panzram made it a point to deny feeling any kind of remorse for his crimes or murders. He stated in his writing, In my lifetime I have committed... I'm sorry. In my lifetime I have murdered 21 human beings. I have committed thousands of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, arsons, and last but not least, I have committed sodomy on more than 1,000 male human beings. For all these things, I am not in the least bit sorry. I have no conscience, so that doesn't worry me. I don't believe in man, God, nor the devil. I hate the whole damn human race, including myself. I have been a human animal ever since I was born. I was a thief and a liar. The older I got, the meaner I became. Yeah, I'd say so. In his autobiography, Pantram wrote that he was rage personified and that he practiced sodomy and rape on the men he attacked in life, not because he was a homosexual, but because it was the way he proved dominance and humiliation. One line in his autobiography wrote, I am sorry for only two things. These two things are, I'm sorry that I have mistreated some few animals in my lifetime, and second, I'm sorry that I'm unable to murder the whole damn human race. Wow. Carl Panzram was led, rather eagerly, to the gallows on September 5, 1930, at the age of 39. As officers attempted to put the black hood over his face, he spat in their faces. 
When asked if he had any final words, Panzram replied, looking at the executioner who was fumbling with tying the noose, Yes. Hurry it up, you Hoosier bastard. I could have already killed a dozen men while you were screwing around. Charming guy. He was buried in the Leavenworth Penn Cemetery in a grave marked with his prison number 31614. So, if you want to go look at the place that lies this just total monster, there you go. 31614. <sighs> Damn. Final notes. Panzram killed five confirmed people, confessed to 21, and was suspected or alleged to have killed over a hundred plus. His crimes took place in the U.S., Angola, the U.K., France, and Germany. One report states that Panzram's family performed a home operation on him for an ear infection as a child. The surgery possibly damaged the part of his brain that dealt with rage control and remorse. Yeah, I'd say they probably screwed it up, obviously. Carl Panzram had a few tattoos from his time spent in various slammers. On both arms, he had anchors inked on, and on his chest boasted a pair of eagles with the words liberty and justice under their wings. I wonder why he would get that put on him, considering the fact that he hated practically everything. Henry P. Lesser preserved the papers that Panzram wrote. In, oh, this is the corrections officer. Preserved the papers that Panzram had wrote in his last days. He spent 40 years trying to have it published, and in 1980, he donated the materials to the San Diego State University, where they are currently stored in the Malcolm A. Love Library. Hey, you want to go read that? Be my guest. I'm not going to read that. <laughs> I mean, that guy's that guy's right now his autobiography and his and his his, his hateful freaking like mindset. I mean, I just uh, I just as rather like you know use it for toilet paper because that, that's all that matters to me. I don't have any interest in hearing what that guy was talking. He, he, from what I've read, from what I read from his. Uh, from the few things that were quoted here, it's probably just one giant string. Uh, it's like the, the Albert Fish from the Albert Fish episode, where Albert Fish uh, left his final his final statement and stuff, and it was just the the lawyer said it was just one giant one one incredible line of of hateful cuss words and profanities. That's probably what the majority of of Pan's rant with Carl's uh, autobiography is. It's just one. Hateful line after another. No thanks. In the song The Nobodies by singer Marilyn Manson, who I also hear is a bit of a classy guy, one lyric is, Today I'm dirt, I want to be pretty, tomorrow I know I'm just dirt, which is actually a paraphrase on Panzram's quote, Today I'm dirty, but tomorrow I'll just be dirt. I would say so. I'm going to have to find or ask for like a nicer episode script because these are like really starting to get brutal. I mean, the, the Gaskins guy and before him, it was that Bobby Joe Long and then this, this, this Panzram dude. I mean, I I don't get I don't really get bothered by any of this stuff, but I would like to cover something else, like that Portland of stage robbery. That was that was different. I mean, even the Slender Man one was pretty scary, but I mean, it still has somewhat of a happy ending. The victim lived. I mean, we I mean, spoiler alert, obviously, but I don't know. I I, I think I need to look into something else. I mean, I'm not talking like stop with the crime channel, but we're looking to different crimes. Oh, and that reminds me, I have an upcoming uh, channel coming up where I talk about uh, different topics of interest, and uh, I'll be sure and link it to the video, to the next video, whenever uh, I would get a chance. So, uh, thank you all for joining in on this episode. I really appreciate it. And as always, I've been your host, Telegraph von Revick, and I'll see you next time.